at the beginning, when you're working in the SaaS industry and you launch a new product, probably 90% of your focus should be on the onboarding flow. Why? Because that's where you lost the most part of your user. Of course, you can try to generate more acquisition, but the problem at the beginning, and it's practically the problem for every SaaS product, is that you lose a lot of people during the onboarding completion. Or some people also complete the onboarding, but they don't use the product one day after. So that should be your first focus as a growth people. Welcome, Thrivecast listeners. Today we have Pierre Jean, Indian from Blah Blah Car. I've been loving all the posts that Pierre has been putting on LinkedIn. He runs a large Substack community now. It's called the Growth Mind. And I have been subscribed to it for the last, I believe, six plus months. So I fell in love with about two or three of his articles, which is where I reached out to him and then we started talking. And then, and soon after that, I fell in love with his accent. He lives in France. He's, I believe, right now in Paris, if I'm saying that right, Paris or Paris. And he has been working with Blah Blah Car for the last two years or so. I'll let him maybe talk a little bit about his background. But on today's topic, we'll touch more about the building and nurturing a growth team. And with uh, Pierre's experience on building and working with Blah Blah Car in that particular space, it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Pierre, welcome to Thrivecast. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation and thanks a lot too for the introduction. I'm glad to be there. I saw you had a lot of good people coming up to the podcast recently. So congrats for that. And I'm glad to be one of them. So yeah, maybe to introduce myself. So as you say, my name is Pierre Jean or Pierre. Uh, a lot of people uh, not from France prefer to call me Pierre because it's easier for them. Um, but yes, I'm working at Blablacar, which is the leading carpooling platform since a bit more than two years now. I'm working as a growth manager on the Western Europe team. And it's been like now six years I am uh, working in the tech and startup ecosystem. So I work in several roles uh, related to marketing and growth during the last years. Yeah, happy to talk about uh, the growth topics we will have to cover today. Absolutely. And to the listeners, uh, you might actually find Pierre on Reforge as well. He's also yeah. a contributing member towards the growth series program for Reforge. So when I saw his name, I started connecting the dots and said, hey, these are good people. I should talk to Pierre. Pierre, maybe let's start with your background a little bit. Could you tell a little bit about your background to all the listeners? Uh, maybe start off with a very high level. What was your background before you entered the world of growth? Yeah, that's a good question because I think there is like no dedicated like course, at least during the education period, dedicated to growth. So that's an interesting question. So I did a master in business, in a business school in Paris. So something which was related to entrepreneurship, marketing, and product. So I was already, it was between 2000 and 2019 that I did my studies there before started working in, in the growth and tech ecosystem. And uh, yeah, I was already interested by all the startup ecosystem. I really wanted to work on a startup to know uh, why it was so dis disruptive, why everyone was talking about startups, innovation at the time. It was pretty new five or six years ago. Uh, this, this tech ecosystem, at least in France, not probably not in the US, it was a bit more mature, but in France, it, it was very new. So it was pretty exciting. And yeah, I started to work like in a really early, early stage startups between five to 10 people sometimes before product market fit. So that's an interesting thing to talk about too. And uh, yeah, I did after that company, which was a startup which was a bit more mature between 100 to 200 employees uh, when I was there in uh, Serie B at the time. And now I'm working on the backyard, which is uh, of course bigger. We have now, I think, uh, we are operating in 22 countries. So in Western Europe, of course, but also in Brazil, in Mexico, in India. So a lot of countries now. And yeah, it's also cool to do growth there because it's a big company and you have uh, different challenges, but that's pretty interesting. Yeah, so I think uh, Blah Blah Car is now in 17 plus countries all over the world. And maybe a quick reference to all the listeners. I encountered Blah Blah Car almost about maybe eight or nine months back when one of my colleagues, she told me that she uses that for, for taking taxis from various places and then i was like hey is that uber no it's blah blah car and it's pretty viral especially in spain and france it's very viral it's growing extremely becoming very popular in asian countries particularly in india now 
So maybe to get started on this, Pierre, could you explain to our listeners, what do you mean by growth? I know growth of a product, growth of a company, and maybe we'll jump into how do you build towards it? How do you nurture the growth team? Let's start with what is growth. That is a very good question because I think if you ask like, I don't know, 10 people in a room who are working in a company, like in a tech company, even in a tech company, you will have probably eight to nine different answers. Uh, is it marketing? Is it product? Is it something else? Uh, is it some kind of engineering? Why do you try to move away, uh, to move up one KPI? So yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. So for me, growth, basically, as the name said, is like how you can move up a KPI. Whatever the KPI it is, is it revenue? Is it uh, usage? Is it the number of people asking for a demo? Uh, it depends of your focus, but basically how you can improve a KPI you're responsible of and which level will you try to activate to improve this KPI. So it could be, of course, like marketing levels. So for example, running ads, running out good campaigns, um, you, you can do a lot of things to drive like top of the funnel volumes, but it can also be like improving uh, the onboarding flow to make sure a lot of people go to the activation moment and like really enjoy your product. But it can also be like iterate on pricing at Blablacar. That's something we do a lot in, in, in my team. And yeah, try to propose the, the best price to your user. So it depends on the focus of your growth team, but it could of course be some marketing, some products, some revenue. And generally you have like people from different teams, different squads, working on, on the same uh, goal and you can have for example people from data people from business people from engineering working together to just grow a specific kpi or set of kpis so i think that's very interesting that you put it very nicely on that so an ability for someone to constantly work on something to improve that thing right maybe and in, in your case what you mentioned is a kpi or a key performance indicator it reminds me of those good old days when they said, hey, we need to have security. So they created a security team. And over time, that was a dedicated security team, right, in the beginning. But over time, it spread across the entire organization that the security is not responsible only for that part. It's the entire company is responsible. The same thing happened with DevOps, where they said, hey, I'm going to go create a DevOps team. And they focused on CI, CD, and DevOps and all of that. And then over time, it became a responsibility across the board. Looks like growth is now starting to get into that space. You have someone who's constantly thinking about growth, but it can be built and managed by collectively, collaboratively across the entire organization. Yeah, so that, totally. As you say, company, practically everyone is responsible for growth. It's just that you have people focusing on different things. For example, us at Babacar, you have like marketing focusing more on top of the funnel KPIs product, more focusing on the experience in the product. But me in the growth team, I'm more having an end-to-end -end funnel view and trying to see which are the levers we can activate. It could be on the product side, it could be on the marketing side, on the pricing side to just generate it could be revenue for the company it could be other thing also but yeah yeah that makes sense which means that someone who's constantly thinking about improving that kpi but the whole collective of the organization is actually working towards making that happen uh, and by the way to all the listeners pure has a very beautiful growth skills test on the growth mine and we will link it as part of the show notes and i took that test and it's amazing he's got about 15 20 questions and then it just gives you a you know, perspective of what are the things that you should be thinking about. So maybe that's a good start here. Why don't we maybe take a case of an early stage startup and then start building that story around it. So let's say if you have an early stage startup, I think by your definition, there's somebody who's thinking about that growth. It's typically a founder and he's bringing that team collectively, right? Uh, he might be bringing engineering, marketing, sales, whatever resources he might have at that time. But now you're talking about, hey, this is now beyond a particular founder, which means that the, the startup has grown slightly beyond the realms of the founder owning this as a dedicated responsibility. He's now delegating that to someone. And who might be that someone? Which means maybe I'll ask this question in a slightly different way. If they decide to have someone outside of the founder to think about growth, who should that first hire be? Is that a PM? Is that a marketing? What kind of role would they hire for when they look for the first hire who's now thinking mm. and doing things about growth? 
Yeah, that, that's a tricky question because it depends on the product. Is it a B2B or B2C product? Is it product-led mainly, like a digital product? Or is it like a service? Yeah, the, the, the answer could be a bit different. But what I would say for the first layer is that you need like someone who is good in practically everything. He's not an expert. He's more like a generalist with... A, a good palette of different skills, someone who is capable of uh, managing SEO, managing SEA, launching outbound, creating a content strategy. Of course, he will not do everything because you have to focus on the lift of things, but also someone who can uh, drive growth through the product. And um, you, you need them to have someone who have a good uh, product sense, not necessarily a PM or not necessarily a, uh, a marketer, but someone which is a bit between both and who can activate the good levers to drive growth. Because at the beginning, of course, you need to drive top of the female volume. So basically people landing on the app store, or if you have an app, landing on your website, if you have like, like a SaaS or I don't know, whatever product. But you also need someone who is capable of working on the onboarding completion, uh, working on retention. Uh, do we need, for example, to send, I don't know, a life cycle email to make sure people are continuously using the product? Do we need potentially to make the onboarding shorter because we see we have a low completion of, of the product onboarding? So you need someone like who is really good at many things, not an expert, a generalist, but someone who is capable of looking at all the funnels, looking at the data. So of course, you need someone who is also good at looking at data and which is really data driven someone who is practically everywhere and who is capable of saying okay that's what we need to do at the moment because that's where we lose the most part of our user so yeah someone who has a good business sense who can uh, do a bit of product a bit of marketing like a generalist but yeah that, that's what i would recommend as a first layer and um, the answer could be a bit different for example if you have like a service, probably you will have someone which is more dedicated purely to lead generation because you don't really have all these things about retention and activation. It's not a digital product. It's a bit different. So the, the main goal of uh, the first growth hire would be more to build like a lead generation engine. So that it depends on the product. All right. So one thing what you're saying is I'm just trying to reduce it in my head. If you are a B2B company, you the number of maybe the signups might be not that high so you need someone to constantly think about not so much as data analysis but figuring out how to acquire more of these customers and that might be either a bmm role or a product manager role but if it's a b2c company the signups are happening at a very faster rate, right like blah blah car and other the self-service signups are like constantly increasing so you need someone probably like a data analyst who now jumps in to understand what the acquisition rates looks like, what the activation looks like, what the retention looks like, where are the drop-offs, and then figure out and analyze that growth strategy. Am I right in that, you know, in summarizing what you just said? Yeah, that's pretty much it, of course. And I was thinking of that. You were talking about Reforge. So I took a course at Reforge like a few weeks ago now. And... We had a session with the head of product growth from Notion. So Notion, of course, is a very well-known product, actually by everyone, I think, in your audience. And she was saying, at the beginning, when you're working in the SaaS industry and you launch a new product, probably 90% of your focus should be on the onboarding flow. Why? Because that's where you lost the most part of your user. Of course, you can try to generate more acquisition. But the problem at the beginning, and it's practically the problem for every SaaS product, is that you lose a lot of people during the onboarding completion. Or some people also complete the onboarding, but they don't use the product one day after. So that should be your first focus as a growth people. And then you can focus on leveraging acquisition. But then fix the basics, make sure your product is working for the people who are signing up to it, and then you can scale acquisition. Got it. Don't focus on acquisition first. Focus on whoever you're trying to acquire. Are they getting activated? You know, meaning, are they onboarding well? And if that process is nice and smooth, then and only then start looking into acquisition. It looks like that's your guidance around it. Maybe yeah, let's, of course. Yeah. Maybe let's build upon that. In that particular case, the KPI for that growth team is not a constant KPI, it looks like. right? In the beginning, when you get a first hire, your primary focus might be how to improve onboarding, how to on improve your activation rate. So it looks like the KPI at that time and your North Star metrics, if you will, at that time 
uh, is not yet retention. It is about activation. So with the assumption that if the users are getting activated well enough over time, you can then start figuring out how do you retain them. But if you can't even get activated, you can't even retain them. It looks like the, the first KPI for that team yeah, is going to be on activation metrics. And typically these might be how many of them have completed setup, how many of them are using the product, what's the drop off rates looks like. These are the right mix to begin with. These are activation metrics. Yeah, I think it could be like a really good KPI or the KPI could be more like probably the number of active users and it happens. Of course, it is powered by, by acquisition, but also a lot by activation. So yeah, probably like a good, the number of active users, at least at the beginning, because maybe you're a bit early to start talking about monetization, even if you need to generate revenue, of course. But improving monetization when you are in the early stages, it's a bit early, you are more trying to generate usage, uh, having people who really love your product. Yeah, the number of active users for SaaS, for example, or mobile app could be a really good KPI at the beginning. Then after, you will more look at when you have a solid base of active users, you are more looking into like, how do I monetize them if you don't uh, do it already? Or, or I, how do I improve the average revenue per user, things like that, to the final revenue. Yeah, that's, that looks like that's a good playbook. I haven't heard anyone speak those terms. It looks like you're a lot more clearer on that. So activation first, improve that. Then go ahead and improve your acquisition metrics. How do you get your signups? You get more and more signups at that time. And then as you're doing that, figure out how do you improve your conversion metrics. Yeah. So if you're able to convert and you have activated, you have improved your signups, so you're now able to convert them better. Once you have these things done, then get to the retention metrics, right? It's, it's getting very clear in my mind. It looks like this is a playbook, uh, but I haven't seen anyone talk in this particular sense. So yeah, it compliments on thinking about that. Yeah, and it's interesting what you say because a lot of people tend to focus on acquisition at first, uh, but especially if you don't have a clear product market fit. And generally, what means you have a clear product market fit is that you have people sending it to your product who use it and who are ready to pay for it. And a lot of people tend to focus even before reaching the product market fit on the acquisition. We need to uh, scale uh, our outbound campaigns. We need to uh, run more efficient ads. But that's a bit useless to do it at the beginning because you will throw money to the window just because you can have... Uh, a lot of people going to your website and signing up to the product, but if they don't use it at the end of the day, they will not pay for it and you will not generate revenue, even if you have like super solid and bone campaigns. Yeah. And looks, if you get more and more users to come and use your product and your product is not ready, uh, these used users will probably not come back again for a very long time unless they mm. find a good reason to be. Meaning if they get their tongues burned with hot milk <laughs> from the very beginning, uh, they're not going to come back to it, right? even if you give them a nice ice cream a little later. So, if you look yeah. at Clubhouse, I don't know if oh, you yeah. remember Clubhouse, like the yeah. audio uh, social app. Yeah, I think that that's what happened to them uh, because they were really good at driving people and like a crazy hype around the yeah. app. And they had like this uh, pretty smart system of you needed to receive an invite from someone, from a friend or colleague to sign up to the product. So you were like, oh, I don't have an invite. I need to have one. Everyone is on Clubhouse, but I'm not. And it created a lot of hype around the product, making it something like super rare, dedicated to like famous people. And everyone wants to, to go on Clubhouse. Yeah. A lot of people signed up to the product, but one month after that, no, no, no one was using it anymore. I don't know if you know someone who is using anymore Clubhouse. I was also one of the people who signed up to Clubhouse. By the way, in the US, we also had a Columbia house and they had the same thing. Like the Clubhouse, you had the... So these guys used to call you and then send you some offers and you'd go in, you they would send you offers to acquire you. You go browse, go try it out and then get some CDs here and there. And then after that, nothing at all, because the app itself was so damn difficult to use. Getting Makes that, sense. Getting, yeah, getting that was, was painful. So that's a very good advice. Uh, let me jump quickly to the next one. So now let's say you have your activation metrics done. You Now you're focusing on bettering your onboarding, right? And let's, say, let's assume for, that, for a moment that's getting done. And then that's where you're focusing on, the, on your acquisition metrics. While all of this is happening, the founder who 
initially started all of this or the leader within the company who started all of this has pretty much handed over the mechanics of growth to this now dedicated person that you have hired who's now focusing on the data what's the role of a leader at that time when you started to acquire more and more users is the role of a leader to almost give complete autonomous rights to this ubiquitous growth team hey you guys go figure out the the analysis around it and then keep on improving or does he or she participates in figuring out what the growth strategy might be so what do you think what have you seen I... for example when i was working in early stage in a very early stage startup i think we were like six or seven when i was working on growth there the founder is i don't know not 100 percent on this on his time but a lot of his time is like dedicated to growth so he was working with me a lot and i was working with it a lot so basically he was like very implicated on growth when i say implicated on growth he was like executing building things sending building campaigns things like that of course, when the company grows, the CEO is more like a leader and he is not like with the marketer or the product manager, a big page. So it's totally different. It's more, uh, you have a CEO which, which is uh, for, for growth, which is more like shaping the vision, um, making sure everyone is aligned on the company ambitions and the company objective, which are our priority for the year or for the quarter. So mm -hmm. this is more like a directional and visional work, so like motivate everyone behind you. So far, we don't have the CEO who is working with us on which messaging should we change on this landing page. That's a bit different, yes. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's good. Of course, leaders cannot go completely hands off. So I think maybe reviewing some of these metrics looks like you're, you're saying that, hey, that's a good idea. Being able to participate and drive the growth strategy might be another good thing. Maybe to get this in a larger perspective, maybe very personalized to what Blah Blah Car is doing, could you tell a little bit about how does Blah Blah Car think about growth? How do you think about it, operate growth? What challenges that you see? And, and of course, Blah Blah Car is not a typical B2B company. It's like a B2C more. How do you manage that? Yeah, that's a good question. So on my team, we are focusing on Western Europe. And basically, we have some focuses. We work a lot on pricing, for example, so to make sure, like, provide enough saving for the driver. And we also propose a good price mm -hmm. to passengers uh, because we need to make sure, like, everyone is happy. It's a marketplace. So you, you basically have supply and demand. Supply for us is driver. If we talk about the carpool side, we also do bus, for example. But I will just focus on the carpool side for a moment. So we work a lot on pricing. And that's one of the levers we activate a lot. Uh, but we can also work on um, other KPI and depending on the focus of the moment. So for example, we do regular weekly marketplace check. And when we found that, uh, I don't know, something is broken, something is not working as we wanted, uh, it's not at the level of the forecast we, we, we did a few months ago. Basically, we will look at it and see, okay, why yeah, this KPI is not at the level we wanted? What can we do? Do we have... Uh, specific lever we should activate i don't know maybe we should launch a new acquisition channel or double down on an existing one mm -hmm. or maybe we should reduce the price for this specific type of, of user on this specific type of destination that's the kind of things we look at and generally we work a lot also with other teams of course with engineers data analysts to analyze like the result of our test with product manager too who are generally at the back are responsible of a part of the the product and also with people from marketing when we need to basically drive top of the funnel volumes got it do you have growth teams uh, for each of the countries it looks like you have you you focus on the western europe so are there any growth teams for other countries other geographies as well yeah we also have a team which is doing like practically the same work than us for the Western Europe part, but they are focusing on LATAM, so Brazil, Mexico, and so on, and Central and Eastern Europe. Got it. So each of the regional teams, so you have your own goals. It looks like in your case, because it's a B2B, B2C product, every transaction, yeah. you want to optimize every transaction, which is why probably pricing is a good indicator of activation for every transaction, which is I, I think that now it, it makes perfect sense. So if you improve the pricing and if you improve that marketplace, it is cheaper, it's more inexpensive for the rider to jump on a car and, and get from place A to place C. 
What do you see are the challenges around doing something of this at scale? Looks like Blah Blah Car has a lot of users now. What are the challenges doing this at scale? Because every single small yeah. thing that changed now has an impact across an entire uh, large set of users. Yeah, yeah that, that, that very good one because we have some countries like in France or Spain, we are very like mature. We know what we do. Of course, you can always improve a lot of things and we are always working on it. But we also have some countries, I don't know, for example, Germany, Italy, where we could be better and we know it. You have like challenges of replicating what you're doing great in some countries in other ones. And uh, it's sometimes a bit different because the country is different. You don't price uh, your product the same way uh, you do in France than you do in Italy, for example. Uh, you need to have a different messaging to attract users, to convert them. So you have some local specificities and things to, to, to adapt depending on the market. So expanding the good things we do to other countries is, of course, a challenge. You also have a lot of challenge at optimizing what you're already doing great. You have good conversion rate in your product, but can you continue to improve them? Uh, can you gain a few per percentage points uh, of conversion in this part of the funnel or this one? That's always things we look at too. And basically, one of the most challenging things too is to stay focused also, because uh, of course you can do a lot of things, but you always need to choose two, three, four, five things maximum. You will uh, focus on this quarter, this guy, um, and, and not take all the project uh, because uh, basically you are, everyone has a lot of ideas, uh, but you can do everything and you always need to focus like on the most impactful one. So you always have also the challenge of, yeah, jumping on the right priorities, doing the right thing at the right moment. Yeah, so the jumping on the right priorities, prioritizing the work because it looks like there's a lot of challenges, a lot of, lot of variables. So you have to pick and choose your battles. And that's a great summary, Pierre. I know we are out of time. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful experience to have a conversation with you. And thanks for sharing. I was able to pick some of your parts of your brain. So I'm pretty glad that I learned quite a bit. I'm, I'm sure our listeners would have done the same. And once again, Pierre, thank you so much. Thanks a lot for the invitation. And to all our listeners, thanks for listening in. If you have any thoughts and suggestions on any guests and topics that we should talk about, uh, please do reach out to us.